Well, good morning. It is good to be with you on our second week of our new series, Family Blueprints. And last week we tackled just a basic fundamental that we have God's original design for the family. I think it was a great start to our series and uh, on Mother's Day. Moms, I hope you had a great, great day. Did you? I hope you did. I hope you did. So Today I entitled our sermon, Building with Imperfections. Building with Imperfections. If you want to build a godly home, you need to know a couple things moving forward that are sobering and needed. We face two adversaries that come against the family and building the family. And we all know the first one is the devil, Satan. He doesn't like the idea of a godly family because the value of a godly family comes against his kingdom. And then there's one that's a little bit more sober, a little bit more humbling because it is really close to home. The other adversary can actually be ourselves, our sinful nature. And I want to talk about that today as well because we need to go back into the beginning of time when the family that God created, well, they fell. They messed up. And now we're all part of that journey as well. And we're very familiar with that story, but it's important that we look back and learn some lessons from them. I have good news, though. Jesus is stronger than both of those things. Amen. Praise the Lord. I was reading in an article by Forbes magazine, and the question was, what does having a real family mean? And you may, uh, you know, you could chuckle at this, but it's, it's true. Um, basically, there's so much dysfunction in family that people don't know what a real family looks like. And it's, it's true. You know, uh, it, kids are being raised in dysfunction, so that's what they think is the norm. And I have the, the reason why today is because of what happened in the garden. That's where all of our dysfunction stems. And make sure we look in the mirror, right, because we all have our own issues, right? So we kind of bring those things in, and then we learn those things from our parents and all that stuff. And unfortunately, that's why we build with imperfections, because I've never seen a perfect family in my life. I've never seen a perfect person, never seen a perfect marriage. It just doesn't exist. Am I right or am I, am I wrong? It's... All right, let's get into Scripture. Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17. God gives us a loving warning to his first family, and I want to read it to us today. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now this was their version of the word of God. This word came straight from God's mouth. There is no argument of what interpretation he's using. Is that the amplified version, the NLT version, the NIV? Is it the King James? It's God's version. God said, there's all these trees. There's one you should not touch. If you do, you will die. Verse 16 includes the first use of the Old Testament major verb for command. So in the Hebrew, it's the first time the major verb used for command is in Scripture. And so this is really the first command that was saying, if you do this, you will live. If you don't do this or if you go and do this, you will die. And so this was the very first major command that came with consequences. And here's the thing. The word of God is the glue that holds all of creation together. Following and obeying the word of God, would, this is what it would have done. It would have preserved harmony in all creation peace, and wholeness on earth. Wouldn't that be beautiful? That's, that's what was intended by the word of God was to hold all things in order and in peace and harmony. 
And if you don't follow it, then chaos comes in. And so God was lovingly warning his, his people, the ones he created, Adam. He's saying, don't touch that tree. Well, we all know there's a tear in the blueprints coming next. Okay? Now, can you imagine, you know, you have your blueprints on your desk and someone tears it up. And we're going to get into how God kind of glues and tapes it back together through Jesus. But we need to look at the tear because the devil tried to destroy the family from the beginning. He tried to destroy God's original design for what God intended. And we need to look at what took place. And we were in the middle of this whole thing. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 13. And we're going to read some scripture to help us grasp the whole context and story. Verse 1 of chapter 3, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, notice she says, God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, Satan replies, the serpent replies to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So their eyes were open. They had knowledge now that they were naked, and this represents the shame of the sin that they did. And verse 8 says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, so you, you see here they're scared, right? I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> you can tell the fall has already started. <laughs> Sin has entered the world. The man replied, he points a finger, it was the woman you gave me, who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Now, I just want to pause for a second, because it is funny. <laughs> it's, it's not, and, it's, and it is, you know, it's, ah, we're so, we're so, man, that's just a perfect example of the fall, the sinful nature, not taking responsibility for our decisions and casting blame on someone else. But it's worse than that. Let me read that again real quick because it looks like he actually accuses God for what God gave him. It says, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. That is something that we do not want to do is blame God. And then blame God another human being, when Adam could have resisted knowing the command first was to not eat. He was the first one to know this. Amen? Well, verse 13, then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent, the devil, deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. And that is true. And she also points fingers at him, but it's true. The devil did deceive. The devil did three things, really, in here. Number one, he sowed doubt, calling into question what God meant by his command. Our world's doing that. The world is sowing doubt into what God's word says versus, you know, what the world wants. So just be aware of that. The devil's still at work questioning the word of God. Number two, he's the king of liars. So he lied about the consequence, saying they wouldn't die. Ross A.P. in his commentary, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, he says this, Satan is a liar from the beginning, 
And this is his lie. One can sin and get away with it. One can sin and get away with it. That is the lie the devil uses. You can sin and there will be no consequences. Don't worry. That is a very false statement. There are consequences to our sin, and especially in this situation. Number three, the devil used the appeal of having knowledge and wisdom like God to draw Eve in. We also believe that Eve was by herself. And just so you know, believers, when you're by yourself, Facing temptation, you're just low-hanging fruit for the devil. By the way, what really kind of concerns me is why was she even near the tree in the first place? What if we need to have our boundaries up way before we get close to the middle of the garden, so to say? Way before we get close to the tree, although the devil can travel wherever he wants and get to you no matter where. So we don't know where she was. Maybe she wasn't near the tree. Maybe she was somewhere else and he brought her to the tree. We don't see that in scripture. So all I know is, is that she was being enticed by it enough to grab the fruit. There's a lesson in contentment here for us. They could eat from all the trees except one. Has this ever bothered you? There's a lot of trees. Why touch that one? Why not be content with the entire garden and just leave that one alone. Well, the reality is the human heart has an insatiable appetite. Our heart is never satisfied. We've been kind of created really with this, this longing for something eternal. You follow me? We're not supposed to be necessarily content because we're meant to have a hunger for the eternal God for our eternal home. And so that is one area that, that we have been made with by God is this, this hunger for him. But the devil took it and got, got Eve to go towards something else and say, you don't have enough trees, how about this one? When the reality is we have enough because God's given us enough. God is enough. Jesus is enough for us today, amen? A lesson in contentment that the human heart is hard to satisfy unless we're satisfied in eternity. And so beware. You know, many temptations wouldn't work if we learn to be content with the blessings we already have. Number two, another lesson in knowing. Uh, here, uh, knowing isn't the same as obeying. Excuse me. Knowing isn't the same as obeying. I find it interesting that Eve was able to repeat the command that Adam must have shared with her, she was able to repeat it, and yet she still fell. It's one thing to know the word of God. It's another thing to obey it. And another lesson is trusting the old and reliable word of God. God's word came first, and it brought order and life. Satan's word came second, and it brought Havoc and chaos. We can trust the word of God, church. No matter what new wave of teaching comes in, we need to hold on to the reliable. Uh, okay, people are going to say it's old, it's archaic. Well, it's still reliable, no matter how old it is. And it still brings order out of chaos. Amen? Well, there's consequences to sin. And let's look at what happens, and we have all inherited the consequences of these things. We're dealing with them today. So let's go to verse 14. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, to the devil, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, referring to... Uh, any, any um, people that the devil influences, even demons, okay, that will be in hostility with all them. And anyone who comes from the offspring of the woman, which is God's people, there's going to be this constant battle between us. And it says here that he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. He's referring to a foreshadowing of Jesus that Jesus is going to take out the devil but the only thing that the devil's going to do is strike his heel. 
It's going to be a wound. And he's going to think that he killed, okay? He's going to think he killed Jesus, but instead Jesus rises again and takes him out. Because Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. This is a very, uh, uh, one of the first foreshadowings of Jesus in the Old Testament. It's a powerful scripture. And this is what he says to the woman. I was sharp, I'm sorry, ladies, that this happened. I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I command you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. Sorry, gentlemen. All of your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made, for you were made from the dust, and to dust you will return. And that's really for all of us who work. <laughs> we all have to go through those consequences. Things are not, in a nutshell, things are not the way they're supposed to be. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. And so we're, we're trying to build life, we're trying to build families in the midst of these difficulties. And verse 20 says, Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve, because she would be the mother of all who live. So that, that's pretty cool. Her name means life. And so Adam, in the midst of this difficulty, had some hope that she would be this person of, of the living, uh, the one who brings life into the world. And then the Lord God made clothing from animal skins from Adam and Eve. That's, that was a compassionate act from God, is that, you know, in this terrible consequence, um, he was still there to help. And he showed compassion, and he actually did the first animal sacrifice to cover their sins, just so we know. So in order to cover sins, there has to be a sacrifice, there has to be death for that sin. And instead of killing Adam and Eve, God kills an animal and then clothes them. That is the first sacrifice of the Bible, to cover our sins. So they are literally covered with clothing, and then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? So there's also the tree of life that God was okay with, but now, now they can't because they've fallen. So they're not allowed to eat from that any longer because they'll live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden and sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword, I don't know how to explain this, neither do authors, that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life so that no one could touch it again. And then we don't know what happened to all that, but there was a flood that destroyed everything, right? Wow. So the consequences were a whole different way of life, a whole different look on marriage and raising kids pain in both sides, and also banishment from the garden that was made for them to tend and care for. That is a difficult journey. So the apple didn't fall far from the tree, though, did it? If we look at Genesis 4, and I just want to share with you, just paraphrasing because of time, but in a nutshell, they had two boys, Cain and Abel, God asked them to bring an offering of worship, and God accepted Abel's, but not Cain's. And Cain had some problems with that. And this is what God says in verse 6 through 7 of Genesis 4, 6 through 7. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. So here we have an example of the sinful nature passing from Adam and Eve into their offspring. And Cain, we all know what happens next. Cain does not master his, his um, evil thoughts and desires, and out of his jealousy and anger, he kills his brother. The apple surely does not fall far from the tree. Like the Holy Spirit is here for us today, God was there for Cain 
warning him and convicting him, don't do this. But he resisted God himself and did it anyway. How many are thankful, though, that we do have the Holy Spirit today to help us? Praise the Lord. Well, let's get to the good news. First of all, the devil does seek to destroy the family because he knows that the family is the greatest brick and mortar of God's kingdom. God's kingdom will spread through the family, so right away the devil comes at the marriage. Have you noticed that, couples? But it's actually before that, because we can miss this, that God tries to separate Eve and Adam from God. I'm sorry, I said God, didn't I? I just heard myself say that. Satan tries to separate Eve from God and Adam from God. Satan tries to get them to walk away from God first, and it worked, didn't it? And now the marriage is going to have its struggles, and then the family is going to have its struggles. So one of the greatest relationships we have, the greatest relationship we have is with God. Amen? And we must be careful that the devil is not trying to separate you from fellowship with God. Because if he can do that, you can, you'll start making the wrong choices for everything else. God repairs the tear. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. I love this scripture. We have to go all the way to the gospel, to the good news of Jesus. Because while there was a tear in the blueprints and a difficulty, God's grace was always with them, helping them. And then God repairs it and gives us hope and power today to raise godly families, starting with Romans 5. And we're going to see this contrast with, uh, with Adam and Jesus. Just so you know, in theology, um, Adam is, you know, the first man, the first Adam, and then Jesus is considered the second Adam or the last Adam. So sometimes you may see that in Bibles or in study of this. So let's go to uh, verse 12, Romans 5, verse 12. When Adam's sin, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not obey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater, praise the Lord, is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift, which is Jesus, leads to our being made right with God, even though... We are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. See how key Jesus is. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness or obedience brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wow. Praise the Lord. Adam represents all of us. 
incapable of living a perfect life, incapable of living a sinless life. And Jesus did, and Jesus lived, and he died, and then he rose again to give us all life. So what are we learning here? We really need Jesus in our lives. (laughs) We really need Jesus in our marriages. We really need Jesus in our families. It's impossible to build a godly family, a godly marriage, and even our own lives, a godly life without Jesus to fix our sinful nature. The Bible actually says, I know this is hard to hear, but the Bible actually says we are enemies of God because of our sinful nature. So we're, we really are an adversary in that sense. Until God gets a hold of us and changes us, we are set free from the power of the sinful nature and now have the power of Jesus Christ living in us. So let's, let's get into application on this. And praise the Lord that... In the midst of all these consequences back then, God was showing compassion. Praise the Lord, God's showing compassion today. Still offering salvation. But number one, we learn from our scripture today that in order to build a godly family, we need to know and follow or obey God's word. We need to know it. And then we need to obey it. Now, how many of you know that you probably heard me say that every week? Or another pastor say it every week. But I'm telling you, church, as a pastor, as, as, as also a believer, um, I'm in the same boat. I can't just know the word of God. I need to apply and do what it says. Eve exemplified this. She knew. She repeated back to the devil. This is what he said. But she still did not obey what she knew. You know, I think half, our, half of our growth would really just increase. You know, half our battles and, and all the growth that we need would increase if we would apply ourselves to the word of God. It's important to understand in this too that uh, we have influence in our family. We have influence. We can steer our families in a certain direction, can't we? See, what happened was Eve steered this family and, and, and Adam went along with it and Adam steered this family in a certain direction and then because of that, Cain and Abel felt the consequences of that. Uh, parents, adults, even young people, you need to understand something that you do have influence. But we need God's word to govern us so we don't choose the wrong way. God's word is critical to govern us because we have this sinful nature as well So we need God's word to help repel the sinful nature in us. Because if we were left to our own vices, we'd probably choose evil. But thank the Lord he sent Jesus, so now we would choose godliness and holiness. Love God. Love God just screams from this first point. To know and obey God's word, to know and follow God's word, is to love God, to be faithful to his word, and your home will be godly. Will it be perfect? No, it won't. But it will be godly. It will be seen as godly from God's point of view. He will see your hearts. He will see what you're trying to do. He will see your journey of obeying him. We all mess up. We all slip up. But if we can love God first and foremost and be faithful to his word, we will cultivate a home that is godly. Number two, we do need to acknowledge our own sinful nature And do not let it master us. Cain exemplified this point. God was trying to help him see that he's struggling with the sinful nature that's in him now. And um, he failed to master it. So we need to master it. Uh, Let me say this. We, We can't live in denial that we have a sinful nature, can we? I also don't want you to obsess over it either. I've seen Christians do that, where they're micromanaging their every thought and decision, and now it's become more legalistic and law-based. Oh, no, I did something wrong. Let me me go do this. Oh, I did did three sins today. I need to do this. You see where I'm going on that? I'm I'm not saying that we always focus so much on our sinful nature that we're like, like stalking it, making sure we're not doing something again and again and again. 
that's not healthy either because now all you're thinking about is sin. So what's the balance there? What do we do in the middle? We need to be aware that we're susceptible, that we're vulnerable to make ungodly choices that could affect our family. But we need to remember as Christians that we are saved by Christ. We are in Christ and the same power, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. We have been set free from the power of sin and death so we can walk in victory and freedom from sinful nature. So this means as we fellowship with God, as we follow Jesus, and as we walk in step with the Spirit's leading, our sinful nature stands no chance of mastering us. What I'm saying is, is if we're consumed with God, we won't really be consumed with our sinful nature. If we're faithful to follow God's word and his leading, we won't be consumed with all of our sinful nature issues. Will it, will it show up? Will we think about it? Yes, and, and we should be aware. We need to be aware that we are susceptible. We are vulnerable to making mistakes. We are not Jesus. We can mess up. But we also just need to focus on Jesus and following him and remembering who we have and where we are. We are seated with Christ. We are standing in Christ as saved. The old life is gone, praise the Lord. A new creation has begun. That is our real identity, okay? We're no longer called sinners. We're called saints. We are considered holy in God's eyes. So now live that way. Walk in that identity. Now, to help you with that, see Romans 7, 21 through 25, or Galatians 5, 16 through 25. We all know that scripture where Paul says, when I'm trying to do what's right, guess what's still there? Sin. As I'm, I'm trying to do what's right, sin is still there. Ready. It's, it's, it's still there. I'm still messing up. So we're going to know it's aware. It's there. But the Holy Spirit comes in to our lives so that we don't do whatever our sinful nature wants, but we do what God wants. Praise the Lord for salvation. At salvation, God gives you the Holy Spirit. That's why before Jesus, you would do things without thinking of it. And now with Jesus, you start to question whether you should do those things. It's simple as that. Uh, this past week, I had, to, I had to send a message to my wife. Um, I'm just bearing my heart to you today. Just to give an example. Um, she was at work and I was, I was preparing this sermon. And I realized that when she was opening up to me about something in her life, I, I heard what she said, and I said, well, that's, that's what I deal with all the time. And the next, I, I felt awkward when I did that, and God convicted me the next day and was like, did you hear what you just did today, yesterday? You, you didn't listen to your wife and care for her and validate her, and instead you made it about yourself. So I sent her this long message because um, she's at work and we didn't have time to talk on the phone. I just said, I just want to let you know, I'm sorry for making it about me. I should have made, I should have cared for you in that moment. Forgive me. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, it's been hard. And um, she sent me back some kissy faces and said, it's okay. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> yeah. But if I'm honest, I think I've, I, I realize I think I do that more than I should. Well, who was that? That was, that was the Holy Spirit nudging me to correct myself, right? And I had to humble myself and send this message. And I didn't say, hey, this is why. I didn't, I didn't give an excuse why I did it. I just owned it and said I should not have done that. I'm sorry. And so lastly, and it goes well at that point, we need to nurture our homes with the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the band to come out. Because we need, we, need, we need Jesus. We need to speak the name of Jesus in our, in our lives. And let me just pause for a moment because I know this is, maybe, the, maybe this isn't what you were thinking today. Uh, let me just speak from my heart. Um, when I do marriage counseling or just counseling as a pastor, half the things we're dealing with is our sinful nature. And majority of the time, 
you know, we're not utilizing the tools to help, like knowing the word of God and living it out would help us not choose the sinful nature. But we also have to know that because we live in this fallen world, we need to be careful to treat each other with the truth of Christ and the grace of Christ. Jesus said that I am the truth. He says that I am grace. We learn in scripture from John 1 that when Jesus talks about he came in grace and truth, that he was 100% truth and 100% grace. And I don't know how that works because he's Jesus, we're not. But in a nutshell, we're gonna need to be honest and truthful. And we're gonna need to also show compassion to one another in our marriages, in our homes, and our kids. The truth is we're not perfect. The grace is we're not perfect. You see where I'm going? In other words, we need to have the integrity to say, I'm sorry to be honest with ourselves and with God, to own things, to be, to be humble and, and come forth and confess that I have not been the right parent or the right husband or to God. God, I haven't been faithful to you. And then we need to be gracious with each other in the home, knowing that that's what we contend with that you contend with the sinful nature and the devil's coming at us. So what I'm saying is Jesus brings us together as a couple, as a family, and we understand that we're battling the devil and we're battling our sinful nature and we're gonna need Jesus in the middle of it. Because that's the way it's gonna be, my friends. And so Jesus comes back, it's gonna be a battle. It's gonna require though that us husbands are honest about what we're doing or being real about those things. It's gonna require us, the, the wives, to do the same thing, to be transparent about our struggles, to be transparent about the things that we're doing. And I know that's hard, but in marriages, it's needed. And when we mess up, there needs to be uh, not just humility and apologies and repentance from one person, but there needs to be patience and compassion and mercy from the other person, amen? The home is glued together with the word of God and the truth and grace of Jesus Christ. News flash for us parents, our kids mess up. I'm speaking for all the teachers in the room, <laughs> youth workers in the room. Guess what? Your kids are not perfect. And teachers, you're not perfect either, are you? Pastors, we're not perfect. Principals are not perfect. Husbands and wives, you're not perfect. We mess up, don't we? We need to come to that reality that nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to be fixed or repaired until the one who can fix it all, Jesus Christ, comes in and does it. I'm sorry that some of you are dealing with things in your home and you're looking at the situation and you're going, there's no way that my spouse is gonna change because they're resistant to Jesus too. Isn't that the reality that we're dealing with in our world? Like we all know that Jesus is the answer, but people are refusing Jesus. That's what we need to pray about today. There are kids in our homes. Hey, by the way, parents, you're not perfect, right? So you didn't raise perfect kids. Now, is this an excuse for us to just do whatever we want? No, that's not what I'm saying. We need to follow the word of God. We need to have the Holy Spirit to help us. We need to operate with grace and patience and truth and honesty, humility, all those things. But no matter how hard we try, there still are times where people fall in our homes. Think about this. Eve had God and the word of God and she still fell. So did Adam. Cain was literally being warned by God, don't do this. And he still chose to do it. So no matter how hard you try, parents, grandparents, 
sometimes we still mess up. And maybe what I'm trying to say is today is our expectations on perfection in our home is wrong. I'm getting real, right? Am I being real? I'm, I'm per, on purpose. Our, our view of family as we're gonna have this perfect nuclear family where nothing goes wrong is wrong. It's not the reality because there was a tear in the blueprints, but the only thing that's gonna repair it is the grace and power of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna stand together. If you need prayer for your family or you want to stay in the gap for a family member, come on down because we're going we're gonna to worship and we're going to sing. We're going to claim Jesus over our families, over our, our lives. My heart with this message today, because we're going to get into relationships and marriage here the next few weeks. Um, my heart is that we understand that basically we're going to need to be honest and truthful and gracious at the same time. We're gonna need Jesus to do this. Would you agree? Let's begin to pray for our family. Let's begin to pray for those we need to stand the gap for. I believe today that God can break the bondage. Lord, and do it now. God, take the blinders off of our family members who are not seeking you, who don't want anything to do with you, God. Lord, humble them. And Lord, answer the prayers of the spouses in this place, of the grandparents, for our kids, our family members. Lord, break through. We're calling on the name of Jesus to do miracles in our families. And it starts with us, God. Change our hearts to live by the truth and grace of Jesus. Lord, minister to us as we worship, we sing this song to you, God. Let it be our cry. In Jesus' name.